Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. If you spend any time on Facebook perusing the BOA forums, you'll see that there are certain types of BOA keepers that just keep popping up again and again and again and repeating the same behavior patterns. Today I'm going to count down the top seven stereotypical BOA keepers that you'll encounter on Facebook. And this video is somewhat done in jest. I know that most of us have fallen into one or more of these patterns from time to time. So don't take this one too seriously. It's meant to be somewhat facetious. And just a little ba bit of background. I don't really participate all that much in Facebook anymore, at least as an active participant. I'm actually a moderator on probably around six or eight different BOA forums at this point. So I have to approve or reject the things that gets posted. So I see a lot of people posting a lot of stuff, but I don't really post all that much anymore, to be honest. But I do lurk and I do read a lot of the stuff and I get ideas for my videos from it. And some of these things just really amuse me. And I'm always amused at how seriously some of the people take the discussion and how heated the debates can get. Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna count down the types of people I just see again and again and again on these forums. And so the first is what I call the, what is my morpher? So this is a person that has a boa and they want to know what morph it is. And more often than not, it's just a normal, you know, Colombian pet store type boa, nothing wrong with that. But they're just convinced that there's somehow there's a morph to it. So either they don't understand that morphs refer specifically to like a gene that has to be inherited or they think that somehow they discovered a new morph. And these are kind of the most amusing because the person is convinced that their boa has this, you know, slight irregularity in its pattern or the color of its tail or its saddle count or its side medallions or something. They're convinced it's a morph and they're gonna breed it. It's gonna be heritable. They're, it's gonna be the next greatest thing. You know, watch out Peter Call because here comes the new morph and uh, you better, you know, be careful of this. So people try to convince them it's not a morph and usually they get kind of pissed off and sometimes these debates will kind of you know fly off the rails and they're just not willing to understand that what they have is not going to be the next million dollar boa breeding project and they should just enjoy their boa as the pet uh, you know that it deserves to be enjoyed as and so the next group is actually a variation and this is what i call the what is my locality type boa person they're it's the same type of, of thinking. They're convinced that their boa has a specific locality. And even though I guess in theory, every boa originates somewhere, when you try to convince them that there's no way that you can tell, and you know, locality of boa is not something that's innately attached to it. It's more a matter of the documentation and you know, the pedigree. They don't want to hear this. And they're convinced that you can just look at a boa and you can somehow tell its locality. And because they don't know the locality somehow, you know, they're at a disadvantage or, you know, they're less of a boa keeper. Just some, you know, ridiculous idea about that. So, um, you know, not every boa has a locality and it's, that's fine. Okay, you know, the whole locality concept has been blown somewhat out of proportion. As much as I like the locality boas, I know a lot of the concepts behind them just don't really make sense. And I think a lot of it is just more marketing, which is the subject of another video. But you know, if you have a boa, don't be concerned about its locality. Um, probably the majority of pet boas out there do not have a morph or locality. They're just normal, you know, Colombian pet store type boas. And there's nothing wrong with that. These things make great pets. So if you have one, don't be obsessed with its morph or its locality. The second type of boa keeper on the Facebook forums is the boa hypochondriac. And this is someone who is convinced that there's something wrong with their boa. Probably the most common thing you see is someone is claiming that their boa is looking up at the cage or raising its head irregular, irregularly, and they're convinced it must have IBD, and they're terrified, and it's got stargazing disease. And you try to explain to them, no, that's pretty normal, a boa is looking up because maybe it wants food, or maybe it's just stretching, or maybe it's trying to get out of the cage but they're convinced they've heard about this IBD that's spreading like wildfire through collections and you know killing millions and millions of boas. They're convinced that they are the latest victim. Um, another variation is someone who's obsessed with their boa pooping. And geez, it's been two weeks since my boa has taken a dump. What should I do? Should I take it to the vet? Should I call him the professionals? You know, you, ha you tell them that, you know, sometimes boas don't go for quite a while. 
You know, you tell them soak your boa, you know, give it some exercise, put some stuff in the cage that it can climb on that'll help, uh, help it relieve itself. But they're convinced that, you know, they need to know their boa's poop schedule. They need to understand exactly when it takes a dump. And then if it's been more than a few hours from its regularly scheduled poo, that there's something wrong with it. One other type of boa hypochondriac is the person who's sure there's something wrong with his boa because of where it is in the cage. Either it's spending all its time in the hiding place, or it's spending all its time on the cool side or the hot side, or it's not moving around enough. There must be something wrong with it. And you tell them that, you know, as long as you've carefully checked your hot spot and your cool side temperatures and they're not out of whack, it's fine. If the boa wants to hang out on one side of the cage, that's fine. If it wants to hang out in the hide, that's fine. If it wants to hang out in the open, that's fine. Every boa is different and they all behave differently. And you don't need to obsess about these minor variations in your boa's behavior. The chances are there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So don't worry about it. If you think your bow is sick, it might be fine. And a lot of the beginners, I think, just see this, these signs that they're misinterpreting and they're somehow convinced that there's something wrong with their boa. The third type of boa behavior I see a lot on Facebook are something I call the red tail police. And these are the people who need to constantly be reminding other people that their boa is not indeed a red tail. So I thought I'd grab a, a true red tail for the sake of this segment of the video. So I've talked about this before. There's the true red tail boa constrictor constrictor. There's what's known as the Colombian or pet store red tail boa imperator, which does have a lot of red in its tail. Personally, I don't care if someone calls their boa a red tail boa, it doesn't matter to me. They can call whatever boa they want. If it's got some red in it, that's a red tail boa. Maybe not scientifically, it's not boa constrictor constrictor, but who cares? You know, it's, it's, the, I, whenever I see this kind of a comment, someone says they went, they got a, a, a red tail boa at the pet shop. There's a picture of it. It's pretty obvious. It's a Colombian boa imperator or something, to, you know, of that effect. And then like 10 people jump in, no, that's not a red tail. You know, and they got to belittle the person and, you know, put them down. And it's just not the best behavior because these people, they don't know the difference. They're just new to the hobby. They like their boa. They, you know, they think it's a beautiful animal, which it is, and they don't want to be told that, you know, it's, it's inferior because it's not a true red tail. The whole term true red tail, it just doesn't make sense, you know, as opposed to a false red tail. So if you're saying something is a boa constrictor constrictor, that has a very specific scientific meaning that, you know, any scientist can understand. If you just call someone it's some, something a red tail or a true red tail or a Colombian red tail or a Suriname or a Peruvian red tail, those are more pet, you know, pet industry terms and hobby terms. Um, so it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me that these people are taking it so seriously. And, you know, it's almost like they feel like they're threatened. Like if somebody claims that their pet store boa is a true red tail, somehow it's diminishing the value of their true red tails. And, you know, they're a true red tail keeper. They're in like the elite, you know, so they have to like put down the people who are new to the hobby and don't understand and just have their regular, you know, old pet store boa. But, you know, it's kind of, I, I always uh, kind of, I find, I always find those types of comments really distasteful and uh, just, if you know, if you just don't comment, you know, unless someone specifically asks what the difference is, then you can comment. Um, you can refer them. I've done videos on this uh, topic. You know, there's like a million videos on YouTube about the difference between a true red tail and a non-true red tail. Um, but no need to put down the person and make them feel inadequate. The fourth type of behavior, stereotypical behavior on the BOA forums is something I call the old time keeper. And I confess I probably fit this category sometimes on the rare occasions when I am commenting. But this is the person that's always reminiscing about the old days and how good it was when they were bringing boatloads of red tails from all over the world and you could get snakes all over the place and rodents were, you know, 50 cents a dozen and, you know, all these great things that supposedly happened in the days of yore. So a lot of these things are obviously exaggerations, if not fabrications. I always am amused by 
you know, when they claim things like, yeah, I used to get pick up true red tails down at the local five and dime. And we used to have pure Sri Lankan pythons coming in every day. I don't know where these comments come from. Most of them are probably just out of thin air, but they always crack me up. And I always get a kick when you have a new keeper that's showing off their setup and then you got one of the old school people you know yeah back in the day we had a hundred watt bulb and newspaper and things were great and i you know i still keep my reptiles that way and you know and then you got the new people attacking the old timers you know someone that's been keeping reptiles for all of six months and has a ball python and a pet store boa but they they they're the experts because they've read all the care sheets and they've watched all the youtube videos and you know god forbid someone has like 30 years of experience actually keeping and breeding these animals you know they know more because they're the keyboard worker but it's always amusing whenever you see a an altercation between these two types which happen fairly regularly. The fifth type of stereotypical boa behavior on the Facebook forums is what I call the husbandry enforcer. This is someone who needs to tell somebody that what they're doing is wrong and that they need to refine their boa keeping husbandry. And you know, sometimes people do ask husbandry questions and they're new and they just don't know. You know, and that's fine if, if someone wants that information and is asking for it. But you often see somebody post a picture of their boa just to share the picture of the boa and yet someone has all kinds of issues with something in the picture and one very common thing that happens is the snake will be overweight or obese and the people have to jump all over that and you know put the person down you know and a lot of times these snakes do look kind of pudgy um but you know the person just posted the picture because they wanted to show their boa and they they weren't looking to get lectured on how fat their snake is sometimes the snake is not fat at all that's the thing people think they understand when a snake is overweight and when it's not maybe the snake just fed and it looks kind of pudgy because of that you know maybe the snake is going to give birth so there are you know a number of reasons why the snake might look different maybe there's nothing at all wrong with the snake and you know the person is underfeeding their snakes but the thing that makes this type of exchange kind of problematic, the person didn't ask about, well, you know, what did you think of my snake? Is it obese? They just put a picture up there for people to enjoy, and they weren't looking to get schooled, so to speak, even though the schooling might be completely wrong. Another thing that I've seen a lot is that somebody posts a picture of their snake, and maybe it's in an enclosure, maybe it's not even the enclosure it actually lives in, but the people have to jump all over them and tell them what's wrong with their enclosure. It's too small, the substrate's wrong, it doesn't have enough st mental stimulation. You know, often uh, it cr kind of cracks me up. Someone will write, this is not its enclosure. I'm just taking the picture in there because they know that these types are just waiting to pounce and to, you know, show off their knowledge of snakes they've gained on the forums. I imagine there are a bunch of different motivations that cause someone to behave this way, but maybe it just makes them feel better about their own reptile keeping husbandry to correct in someone else's and put them down. I don't know. You know, these are the definition of keyboard warrior types. They're always going to find fault with people and they always want to share it in public and you know, kind of make an example of them. And you know, it's kind of strange, it just, just occurred to me, you have those types of people, but it's also kind of a codependent type of relationship because you have the people who are asking questions, and these aren't really questions they even should be or need to be asking. Basically, somebody is going to do something that they know is probably not a good idea, and yet they want to put it up there in public, and maybe someone will back them up. But of course, no one ever backs them up and they just make themselves look like a real ass. You know, a lot of times I've seen things where someone has a snake that's clearly too small to be bred. It's like two year old female boa. It's, you know, all of three and a half feet. And they're going on about, yeah, you know, I, I'm really thinking of breeding this. And they want, somehow they want like someone to back them up. And yet, of course, they're going to get ripped apart. So it doesn't really make sense that they're going to, you know, go to a public forum and you know, do this kind of behavior. Another thing is someone, maybe they're keeping a snake in a cage that's too small, or maybe they're doing something that is generally looked upon as really bad husbandry, and yet they somehow they want somebody to maybe back them up, and so they ask the question. And you see it a lot with cohabitating. 
you know, and I've done, I did a video on cohabitating recently and it's not always wrong and you know, people often will attack someone who cohabitates just because they're cohabitating when really it might be perfectly fine. But if you want to cohabitate, just cohabitate. You don't need to like put it up there in the public and have people vote, you know, do you approve of my cohabitating? No, just do it. If you're going to do it, do it. You know, you understand the risks and you understand the repercussions. So why bother to ask in public? You don't need someone's permission to keep two boas in the same cage. So I think without these types of people, you wouldn't have the keyboard warrior assholes who are always ripping people apart and putting people down. Just my two cents. The sixth type of stereotypical BOA behavior you see on Facebook is especially prevalent in the locality forums and you know the pure BOA type forums. And these are the designer name droppers. And so you see a lot of people using these bloodlines. And often the person is just identifying their BOA by its bloodline. They're calling it a Fudo or a, an Eckert or a Rio Bravo. They don't even tell you what type of boa it is, which is kind of ridiculous. And you know, it's almost like it's a designer label and they want you to know that they can afford the best of the best, this, you know, very exclusive bloodline boa. You know, I've, I did videos in the past about bloodlines. I think it's kind of a crock to be honest, not what the actual definition of a bloodline, but the use of these bloodlines becomes more of a brand. And it doesn't really even make sense because you know, when you're taking bloodlines to nth generations, then really no longer that bloodline. It's only a bloodline for like one generation. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense, unless of course you're gonna directly inbreed them, which is a whole other can of worms. So it's, I think it's more helpful to just say this, this is a Suriname boa of X such and such bloodline if you wanna do that. But it, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way when people are just talking about bloodlines, like almost like it's some kind of a exclusive brand name. And you see the same thing with localities as well. Here's my poker ground boa, or here's my tomato ma boa, you know, and what does that really mean? I mean, maybe even if you know that the boa actually originated from there, it doesn't make it any different from a boa from like 10 miles away, which of course is the topic for another video. So I think sometimes, although I, I love the whole locality concept, I think people are just really taking it to the extreme where it's no longer productive and um, it's not really doing anyone a favor. And it just comes across as elitist and snobby to be calling your boa by its bloodline or by some supposed ultra specific locality. But you know, I see this behavior a lot and I, you know, it's, it will probably continue um, you know, it's certainly among the, the people that consider themselves the more elite in the boa hobby. And finally, the seventh type of stereotypical boa behavior I see on the forums is something I call the scientific name corrector. These are people that have to follow what everyone is calling their boas, and if there's anything that doesn't agree with the latest taxonomy, they have to point it out and correct the person. So as we all know, boas were once boa constrictors, were once all boa constrictor, all of the imperators, all of the, what's referred to today as, as boa sigma, all of the boa constrictors from Mexico through Argentina were all one species with like eight or nine subspecies. And then like five to eight years ago, they were reclassified as three separate species. So that's fine and that's great. And you know, if you read the paper, it make, kind of makes sense. And it's probably, you know, a useful reclassification. But if somebody calls something a boa constrictor imperator like this one, or a boa imperator, what difference does it make? It's the same snake. Um, you know, the boa doesn't know the difference. The boa doesn't give a shit if you call it a boa imperator or a boa constrictor. It's just a pet, you know? So, I don't know. I, I guess maybe people feel like they're more elite if they correct other people. And I, I see this a lot. Like I, I had uh, some of my earlier videos, I called the boa uh, imperator longicata, a boa constrictor longicata. Um, you know, it wasn't until relatively recently it was reclassified. And that paper that came out doesn't even specifically mention uh, uh, longicata or sabolgae or any of the subspecies. It just says basically boas that are um, east and south of the Andes are called boa constrictor. You know, if it's north of the Andes or west of the Andes, that's boa imperator. So that would be like longicata. But who cares? I mean, it's the same snake. So, um, you know, if you want to call it 
Imperator, if you want to call it constrictor, it doesn't matter. There are even people who don't even recognize that and they're still calling them boa constrictor imperator. So that's fine. I mean, like I said, it, it doesn't really make a difference. And the thing is, unless you really understand the science of why they were reclassified and you agree with that, then you have no, no place putting someone else down for calling it something else, just because that's maybe not the latest fashionable thing that the scientists are calling it. So I, you see more and more animals being reclassified and you got to think, well, is this just because it gives these scientists something to write papers about? You know, they got to publish or perish. And as a scientist myself, I know how strong the pressure is to publish. But you're just inventing new things so that you can come up with papers. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so anyway, that was my list of the stereotypical Facebook boa keeper behaviors. Um, we probably have all fallen under one of these categories at some point. You know, I know I have. So I'm not trying to, you know, correct any, anyone or, you know, tell anyone how to behave. But, you know, it is kind of amusing to see that these types of behaviors just keep getting repeated. I'm sure that on other types of forums of people that do other activities, you know, the behaviors just manifest in slightly different ways. But the underlying motivations are always going to be the same. So anyway, I hope you liked the video. Got a few chuckles out of it. Um, if you have any stereotypical behaviors that I missed, please add them to the comments below and uh, tell me what you think is your most annoying Facebook boa keeper behavior. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.